Uh, welcome to the second series of the FIG online seminars. My name is Teko Mohodzi. I'm a member of the FIG Education Commission. Our topic in this seminar is we must be gymnast centered. And with us today to unpack this topic, we have uh, Mr. Hadi Fink. I'd like to welcome you, Hadi Fink. Hadi. Hello, Seiko. Nice to see you. And what, 20,000 kilometers apart? About as far as you can be on this earth. <laughs> yes, and many hours time zone difference. That too, yeah. All right. Um, most of us know you, Hardy, as uh, being the director of FIG Education and Academy Programs. Uh, but uh, not many of you know your, your other history, which is uh, you've been a member of the FIG Men's Technical Committee since uh, 1988, and you were the president from 1996 to 2000. You're also the Canadian men's national coach and high performance director. You've been a lecturer also in uh, biomechanics and coaching science at the University of British Columbia. So we're really happy to have you with us to present this topic. So if I can ask you, Hardy, I mean, what is this topic really about? What is this is the significance of this topic? Well, Seiko, when, when we speak about being athlete centered, um, it's such a big topic because it can involve the entire career and everything that happens in the gymnastics environment. So I've had to try to delimit what I will speak about. And I want to focus, for, of course, it'll be uh, related to high performance training and want to focus what happens in the growing years when gymnasts grow very rapidly. I think you know, we've heard of so much uh, abuse and excess and, and, and very criminal abuse even, but for the overwhelming majority of coaches, no one starts off saying, I'm going to go in and abuse children. <laughs> they want, they're there to help, to help, to help. And somehow the training environment then makes changes subtly uh, over time. And so we have to also look at what incentives are there that suddenly cause a coach that's totally well intentioned to lose some of what they really think they want to do. Okay, so what are you going to focus on now in the seminar? Well, I'll focus on, on the growing years, on what happens in the training environment, and then the rather widespread responsibility and incentives that, that sometimes cause excesses that amount to abuse. Uh, as I said, the topic is we must be gymnast-centered. Welcome all the viewers, and thank you for your interest. So I'll speak about what this means, why is it important, and how can we assure that we are always gymnast centered? So we all know about the recent developments in, in uh, what has happened. You know, the well-publicized scandals have really rocked the gymnastics world. The uh, airing of gymnast A that probably many people saw. The uh, revelations that become ever, ever more frequent, ever more important from the Gymnast Alliance. Um, so we know about this. And what this has done collectively is bring gymnasts centered back to the forefront, that all we must do, all we do do, must be centered on the physical and the mental health of gymnasts. What has also been revealed by all of these um, revelations is that the responsibility for these things is very widespread. It's not only coaches. Um, so federations around the world are responding in many, many ways, and they're responding by um, in some cases, punishment. They're responding by investigations. They're responding by policy statements, by seminars, and perhaps too often with good words rather than good actions. It's nice to say we're going to be uh, transparent. Uh, we're going to talk about empowerment, protection, and so on, but that has to be translated to action. The FIG also in recent years has become ever more focused on this topic. Uh, a decade or so ago, Athletes were named to all of the technical committees, so, um, athlete representatives, and the executive committee. In more recent years, we now have the Gymnastics Ethics Foundation. We have the Women in Gymnastics Commission. And occasionally, the FIG has punished bad coaching behavior through the disciplinary committee. So uh, I think why, worldwide, this is being taken very seriously. However, more interventions are necessary, I think. And of course, they're certain to come. So what I'll speak about is what the meaning is of being athlete, or I'll refer mostly to gymnast centered. Of course, it's for all athletes. And the focus on coaching doesn't tell the whole story. Um, of course, coaches are at the forefront of the criticism, 
but why are they incentivized to do what they do? So the responsibility lies also with legislators as much as with coaches. I won't speak at all, by the way, about the criminal examples of sexual and physical abuse. That's way outside the scope of this topic. I will focus on the excesses and the reasons for those excesses in the training environment and the competition environment. Again, what are the incentives? And these excesses, when they do occur, often amount to what I refer to as technical abuse. And that's of course overlaps also with mental and physical abuse. But I do wanna start right up front to say the overwhelming majority of coaches do an outstanding job of trying to teach and protect gymnasts. No one starts to be a bad coach or to be abusive. It's a very few, few that have brought our sport and its dedicated coaches into disrepute. Those ones I won't talk about. So the FIG started focusing on coach education programs over 25 years ago. In fact, the very first meeting in late 1994 already stated as the fundamental background and fundamental philosophy that everything we do, all of our efforts would be gymnast centered. And the FIG Academy program, as many of the viewers would know, have ever more urgently emphasized the gymnast centered philosophy and the related coaching values. Then since 2011, We've been busily uh, preparing and developing the FIG age group development and competition programs for all disciplines now. And those serve as a recipe for the gymnast centered, the safe and systematic development of young gymnasts. So we have to think also of what the view is from the outside. What do people think of us? And especially the scientific community, the medical community, educational community, and the media professions. And that's even before the recent scandals. This has been a long existing opinion. And they think that we are excess, examples of excessive and abusive coaching practices. It's something that I've probably said at every academy and every age group program camp. So that's how they see us from the outside. And we know they're not wrong. There are just too many examples that we know of and that appear daily on social media. Too many of us, probably all of us, have kind of known this, that, that this has happened for so many years and perhaps close their eyes for too long. So how did we get here? Gymnastics changed. We now have much younger gymnasts. If you go back before 1970, everything related to gymnastics, all the films, all the books showed it adult. And now we see children in high performance training. So we have serious and intensive training of children. And you can see from the pictures how much that has changed. And when I look at the very bottom picture, really? That's an international competition? We must think about what that means and why do we do that? Of course, we've increased training hours. We've increased the difficulty level and the difficulty of, conne of immediate connections. We've increased the size, the magnitude, and the number of peak forces daily and weekly and throughout a year. We've increased the number of repetitions, of course, and this has led to increased injuries and all too often the need or to push to train with injuries. We have more frequent competitions. We have insufficient and inadequate, inappropriate recovery time. And then in the culture and the societal change that sport has become so much part of the entertainment industry, entertainment business. Then we have the problem of damaging or maybe uh, not gymnast centered rules for children. We have the rush related to that to compete with unmastered skills. And we also have a pressure to have young champions. I'll speak more about those last three items as I go along. Gymnast centered, as I said earlier to Tseiko, it's a big, big topic, and it can include meeting the needs of gymnasts throughout their careers. It has to include protection from all kinds of abuse and bullying and harassment and discrimination. It can refer to career planning, retirement planning, safe environments, of course, physical, psychological, emotional, safety, health, well-being. Technical competence, of course, to avoid damaging excesses, which I'll come to. And we need logical and age appropriate gymnast centered rules. And to repeat that, the gymnast centered competition expect expectations, especially for children. So I'm not really speaking about the senior rules, although they reflect sometimes on what's done at lower levels, but let's talk about what happens with children. So I'll solutions, of course, lie in education legislation. I'll talk about that. And I'll focus on those two categories of solutions. Again, especially related to the intensive training of children and especially in the rapid growth years. So what is being gymnast centered? 
First and foremost, everything we do and decide must be focused on the needs of the gymnast. We have to think child first, performance second. Coaches and judges and leaders and bureaucrats and legislators are there only because of the existence of gymnasts. We, we have no other reason to exist, nor does our sport. If there are no gymnasts, we don't have gymnastics. Everything we do must think about how can we enhance the experience of gymnasts. Again, coaches and leaders are there to serve the needs of gymnasts. Competition rules must be there to enhance and support the gymnasts for systematic and safe development towards high performance excellence can never be for the ego. And by this, I mean ego of the leaders or the coaches elsewhere in the environment. For example, look at what my gymnast can do. I can do a double back at age 10 and you can't. We, we can't have that. Or look how I can manipulate and spot this complex skill in magic hands. That's also not what it's about. And look, I can teach these big, big tricks much faster than you can. And I don't need to follow these developmental rules because I want to go faster. So those are often because of ego of the coach of the environment rather than being gymnast centered. So it can never be about the coach or leaders. If, for example, you get caught in the sort of sentiment that a gymnast's performance and you say, you have disappointed me. Once you start thinking like that, you have to rethink because the gymnast isn't there to disappoint you. You're there to enhance, to do everything necessary, to enhance that gymnast experience. And it's also to put the personal and technical growth of the gymnast first. We have to facilitate rather than control, and we have to lead them to be independent adults. So the needs that we must serve as federations, as coaches, safety and mastery of all elements before competing them, physical, emotional health and well-being, of course, competent coaching, provide the necessary human technical training resources, and also provide for a well-planned long-term development and competition career path. And that, that end of the career path, which isn't the focus of this topic, can also be important because gymnasts, once they've devoted so much of their life and so many hours to being top gymnasts, suddenly retire and are lost. And I've heard gymnasts use this phrase, and it's kind of a sad phrase. I went from being a hero to being zero. So we have to prepare that that doesn't affect the rest of their lives. Components of being gymnast-centered, of course, um, this is just a summary. We want them to be safe, and that relates to acute sudden injuries and apparatus-related issues. We want all kinds of physical and mental health, and that's related to a young start for high performance, extensive training, uh, chronic and overuse injuries, incompetent coaching, not enough recovery time, things related to disordered eating. We want our sports to be popular. Large, we want large numbers of participants, and we want long-term participation, lifetime participation if we can. And we want to avoid early dropout, and we want everyone to have access. Of course, the whole ethical aspect, which relates to gymnast-centered, also relates to judging issues, abuse of coaching practices, abuse of power issues, doping, equality, and discrimination issues. And we want our sport to be aesthetic. So the a question that I've often posed is, can we have more gymnastics in the sense of more difficulty? Or can we have better gymnastics? What do we want? Or is it possible we have both? And I think the very best gymnasts in the world show us that it's possible to have both. It's the many that try to emulate the highest difficulty without mastery that shows that they don't have both. We can have, we must have, and we will have in the future. And then there's the rhythm, music, harmony issues, and then issues related to monotony, virtuosity, creativity, originality, and our sport with entertainment value. So all of those are component, components of being uh, gymnast-centered, and many of our gymnastic sports ignore those important components and follow unhealthy practices. Each of those issues are really significant for all of our gymnastic sports, but these ones that I've listed in the darker brown, those are health concerns, and they're influenced by education through the academy program, age group programs, and many other things, of course. And I must say that the FIG has really addressed each of these issues all the way up and down the list, okay? but much remains to be done. So what's the reason for unsafe, unhealthy trends that we see around the world that we know exist, that we have become perhaps normalized? Okay? It's that gymnasts and coaches want to win, and they'll do whatever is rewarded. So the quickest solution, if we want to change this, is to change the reward structure. By the reward structure, I, of course, mean what is in the quota points or the age group rules, the competition rules. So they can be quickly changed, especially at the age group level for children. And what are possible solutions? Well, as I mentioned earlier, they kind of fall into two categories, legislative and educational. So for coaches, I think we focus on the educational solutions, and we have tried to do that, but they take time because you're changing a culture. We make incremental progress. Leaders have to influence those legislative solutions and also review the incentives. And finally, the legislators. By legislators in this context, I'm referring to those that make the rules for competition. 
the codes of points, the age group rules and so on. They have to send at, set athlete-centered expectations and rules, and especially so for youngsters, for children, for youth. So when the re reward structure goes wrong, these are some examples. And this first example is from aerobic gymnastics, but it's really related to under rotating twists. And it can also be for saltos. In many cases, we, we push gymnasts to perform skills before they're mastered and that they have under rewarded, under, under rotated landings, unprepared landings, under rotated twists, under rotated saltos. Okay, we can never, never permit that. We have to eliminate that incentive, and that reward. I think the picture stands for itself. Um, I'm sure with an unstable group above you, that is probably not the best thing for someone's head and neck. This is, of course, from the old vault table, but it shows how incentive can go wrong. Uh, when it became well rewarded to do handspring front saltos with various uh, variations for girls, the best solution for many of them was to hit block at the front end of the horse and arch over and kind of fling off. Well, that arch over put extreme pressure on the lower back and was related partly to the reward structure, partly related to trying to achieve high difficulty uh, by any means possible. Of course, that horse no longer exists. Uh, it's taken years, but now we no longer permit at least the, the higher difficulty rollout elements. But we also, as, a, as an FIG, have to have a common philosophy. If philosophically we say, okay, we don't want rollout elements of this kind, it has to be consistent across disciplines. For example, women, of course, have not been allowed to do this for many years. Men are not allowed to do this now. But if I take the, a full twisting dive roll, and we can argue whether that should be eliminated or not, prohibited or not. In men's gymnastics, it's not permitted, but in aerobic gymnastics, it is. In parkour, it is. You know, do we do we need to have a consistent uh, understanding of the dangers and of what should be prohibited? And then these sort of examples, I've spoken often about excessive passive flexibility and what that means for the normal gymnast population. I'm not sure if being able to sit on one's head is, is really what we want to promote in our gymnastic sports. And then these sort of landings from parkour, of course, parkour doesn't, as we do in, in our other disciplines, require a, a controlled stopped landing. They can land and continue to roll, which permits some mistakes in the landing process. But nevertheless, the skills should be prepared for landing or the landing should be prepared at the conclusion of the skill. And my fear, my fear here is not so much seniors, but landings like this multiple times on hard surfaces by children. So the quota point changes take a long time. For example, the fault table change, it's not a code change, but an apparatus change. That was discussed for 25 years before it was finally adopted. Age group changes can be done very, very quickly because it's usually a smaller group. So when the reward structure goes very wrong, I apologize somewhat for the unclear screenshots here, but even though the pictures are unclear, what is very, very clear is that this cannot be acceptable. We cannot have landings like this. So what happened in this case, this is the Prudenova vault by a girl that did it over the several years. The reward was much too high, the penalty was too low, and the ultimate reward of gold medals, because she was a champion in those three years, made it politically okay. It's the gold medals, the possibility of gold medals that provided the incentive to do this. So this is the most crunched up position during her landings, and then the most crunched up position some 15 years before by Prudenova herself is there. So the discussion is, should the vault be outlawed? I can't answer that question here, but one person 20 years ago now was able to do it perfectly, or essentially perfectly. It's really the incentive, the high reward that forces unmastered skills. In this context, I really asked many times at that time, when does the decision of a coach, decision of a federation become a criminal act? Because she could have injured every single part of her body multiple times. So when the reward structure goes wrong, the FIG leadership has made a lot of progress at the senior level, but maybe not enough for adequate protections for children and for juniors. For example, for men, for women, for rhythmics, for parkour, there are no age group competitions and therefore no age group rules that the FIG monitors. For children, the rules are made worldwide, mostly by volunteer technical committees within the National Federation or a local region or Continental Union. So they can be changed quickly if they want. So I have an example. This is from women's gymnastics, one that I've dealt with recently. Such examples exist, exist worldwide and such examples exist in all disciplines. But this uh, was one where one union, for example, has these age group girls rules, requirements, or I should say rewards for girls. So at age eight, eight 
they're permitted and rewarded for doing C parts. Well, in Florida, that's a double full. On uneven bars, it's a double pike dismount, for example. At age 10, they're rewarded for D parts. That's a double back pike on floor, something like a Shaposhnikova on bars, really. On age 12, they're permitted E parts. So on double, double back with a full on floor, or on bars, double straight with a full. Really? Children should train such elements, really train them for future excellence. They should never be required. They should never be permitted. They should never be rewarded for competing them. And that's my go-to position on, on that. And one of the reasons for that is that legislative solutions drive coaches' behavior. They provide the incentives. Gymnasts and coaches want to win, sometimes at all costs, and they will do what is rewarded. So we need legislators also be educated about growth, about forces, but the cause of injuries. The reward structure has to take growth and maturation into account. The reward structure has to emphasize execution rather than difficulty for children, and especially for children during the rapid growth years, which I'll come to. The reward structure has to promote and prepare for future excellence. And really in most, I think perhaps all of our disciplines, unless there's a major change in apparatus, we can pretty well predict what the future will bring. We know the difficulty now, no one's going to do four flips on floor, unless there's a major change to what the floor looks like. We, we kind of know what's going to happen in the future in terms of difficulty, and it's basically being done now. So the future has to be focused on quality, doing that extreme difficulty with the highest possible quality. If we promote difficulty, reward difficulty, unmastered too early, we will build in permanent errors that will undermine any future possibility of excellence and success. So the leaders and the bureaucrats have to take away the focus and the incentives from young champions young champions based on difficulty. And the reward structure has to permit coaches to follow a gymnast-centered pathway, not to push them away from that. So the common excesses in training, I've referred to these as technical abuses, are excessive training hours. We, you know, 40 hours is not unusual a week. And in some cases, for some disciplines, we see 50 hours a week, really? Excessive numbers of repetitions. We have excessive body shaming and even dietary restriction. We have excessive injuries leading to lost training time excessive training loads and high impacts and under-rotated and unprepared landings, and excessive passive flexibility, excessive training of unilateral and asymmetrical skills. So we know everyone's going to twist either to the left or to the right on their main things. But here I'm speaking again about the training of children. If every pivot is only on the left foot and every leap is from one foot and lands on the same foot, uh, and many skills are asymmetric in landing, for example, in aerobics, where you land in the push-up position one hand at a time, or in most other disciplines, landing one foot at a time. We have to balance asymmet asymmetry and unilateral actions in the, in the growth years. Then excessive training while injured, related sometimes to medical neglect, and excessive stress in the training and competition environment. And that leads to anger and frustration. And that anger and frustration sometimes leads coaches to physical and emotional and mental abuse. So none of that is common, but these excesses we all know about, we have to try to manage them in a gymnast-centered way. So what do we know in general? We know that a very, very tiny percentage of gym gymnasts pursue high performance, and very few of them qualify for world championship. If we look across all of our disciplines, in any one competition year, a cycle even, it's fewer than a thousand that compete at a world championship. It's maybe 20,000 around the world that are serious high performance future world contenders or dreamers. And we lose 80% of our high performance gymnasts before the age of 14 or by the age of 14. And that's really troubling because those are selected, they're talented, they're committed, they're motivated, they've been successful, they're supported by parents and others, and we've invested our money and our resources and our dreams in them. So at age 14, many of them, many retire for legitimate reasons, but many retire because of our behaviors. And everyone that retires for that reason has really sullied and tarnished our sport and our reason for being. We know that high-performance gymnasts mature later than the average by two and even four years. Now that's most high-performance gymnasts can vary a little bit depending on the discipline. For example, the basis in acrobatics might be early matures rather than late matures, but the top will always be a late mature. We also know that approximately 25% of training time is lost or modified because of various kinds of injuries. And that might make us think if we're training 40 hours a week and we lose 25%, maybe we can cut down to 30 hours a week. And these excesses, such as training hours and the ones I've mentioned before, are very common in our sport. And we're much criticized for that, of course. So the educational information is really needed not only by coaches, it's needed also by legislators. So for both, they need to understand growth of devel and development as we deal with children. They have to understand training intensity and overtraining and recovery. 
because we train so many hours. Even if you cut it down to 25 hours, that's still a lot of hours of intensive training. We have to understand anatomy, especially the joints and physiology, because we overload and stress tissues. Of course, we have to know about knowledge of damaging practices and the causes and the prevention. And the ones further down, I won't read them all, are important for coaches. For example, understanding strength and power training because we deal with forces. It's really the responsibility of coaches and of legislators to assure the care and well-being of gymnasts. And of course, for coaches to be technically competent. So I'm going to give a quick reminder. We've had other presentations through the FIG seminar system here about growth and maturation and what that means. But I want to remind the viewers of the critical age period. It's the early pyramidal stage, we refer to this. That's the period of skill acquisition. For girls, typically age 11 to 13, boys 13 to 15, approximately. And we have a booklet when we did this phase one many years ago, which became the underlying uh, information for the academy program. We looked at the maturational information, about 45 pages in that booklet, and then the implications for training. So this is just a tiny little taste. So we know that in that time period, children will grow rapidly for two or three years. Bones grow faster than muscles. Okay, the, bone, the muscles attach to the bone through a tendon, and when the bone grows, it stretches the tendon. So it's very much like flexibility training. So they'll feel a bit more stiff. Of course, they'll gain some mass. They'll still be strong, but they'll have lost some of their not their absolute strength, but the relative strength relative to their mass. So we have to be careful in that time period. We have to be careful with adding complexity that requires increased strength and flexibility. And it's a time to reduce competition difficulty, not training difficulty, competition difficulty. We can train under safe conditions. We know at this time period, the body parts grow at different stages and the body proportions change all the time. That makes the gymnast maybe a bit more clumsy, maybe lose some skills. We also know as part of this process of bone growth is metabolically very, very expensive. It takes a lot of metabolic energy. So we have to increase caloric intake at that time. They should eat as much good food as they can without gaining fat. This is not a time to put the gymnasts on a diet. It is not a time for body shaming. It is very, very normal for the average child to be slightly pudgy not fat at that time period, and at the end of it, to be back to being super skinny. So it's really, really important through this stage to protect the gymnasts through these growth years rather than abuse them, injure them, insult them. Because if you protect them until they're, they've gone through this rapid growth period, you have a champion at age 16, 17, 18. Really, that's when we want champions. Why do we want an 11-year-old champion? And most gymnasts, as I mentioned, are late matures. They mature two, three, even four years later than the normal population. Um, and we select them for that, or they select us because they are late matures, because that makes them successful, especially for the acrobatic sort of skills. And they have open growth plates for longer periods of time. An open growth plate is at risk for shear and for torsion forces. Shear being cutting like this and torsion twisting force. So we have to give them it's just sufficient air time to complete whatever tricks they're doing, the saltos, twists, enough airtime to compete and cut back in competition difficulty. I'll come back to a little bit to that again, but we can never, never, never at this time period permit under rotation. As I say over on the left side, they have open growth plates and they have that risk of shear, of injury due to shear and torsion forces for a longer period of time. And that happens because of under rotations. So these factors during that age period of really critical physical and psychological implications. And we have to be aware of that. Just a quick reminder, children differ from adults in all of these ways, proportions, skeletal, muscular, cardiovascular, respiratory systems, energy, hormonal levels, the need for sleep, psychologically, emotionally. I love this, this picture where the head from infancy increases twice, the trunk three times, the arms increase four times the length, the legs five times. Things grow in many strange ways. Again, a reminder that maturational age is not the same as chronological age. And you can see here a group of 13 year olds and two girls in rhythmics, 12 years old. They're normal, they're completely normal. But it's the smaller ones for most of our gymnastic sports that have a long term gymnastics future. But they're the ones we have to protect, they're the late matures. And even here, for a 13 year old, if you have an early maturing 13 year old, would be more like a 16 year old. A late maturing 13 year old might be like a 10 year old or 11 year old. There can be five or six years maturational difference at the same age. And even more so if it's mixed boys and girls because girls tend to mature about two years faster. 
if we have an age group range, and I'll refer here to the men's junior age of 14 to 17, which I've criticized many times, well, we could have a late maturing 14-year-old uh, that's more like an 11-year-old, and an early maturing 17-year-old that's more like a 19-year-old. Suddenly, you have seven or eight years of matural, maturational difference in the same age group, and we really have to think about what that means. In general, the quota points should not be used as the basis for age group competitions. There's very little in the quota points that can be used for 11-year-olds and 12-year-olds or should be rewarded. And then finally, a reminder on growth plates. We have growth plates at the end of every long bone and they come under compression all the times. We have growth plates where every tendon attaches from a muscle, both ends, and each of these are susceptible to shear forces. They can be torn off or torsion forces. We can never permit under rotation. We can never permit or should uh, largely curtail asymmetric landings on one leg, on one arm at a time. So a quick summary, we want safe and healthy systematic training of gymnasts towards excellence, and that means gymnast centers. It requires us to understand this critical 11 to 15 year old age period, because this is the time when they have the capacity to learn incredibly complex skills. The neuromuscular system is perfect for that, but they're growing rapidly. They're susceptible to all kinds of injuries. They're susceptible to emotional and psychological damage. And this is made worse because they tend to mature late. We have to protect them through that time period. If we're careful through that time, we have a champion. If not, we're part of that 80% loss of our high performance athletes. As I say so often in all the courses I've taught, train the future, don't compete the future. Really what, what happens here is that we have, well, I'll come to back to that later. The rush for young champions, is that gymnast centered? So in women's and rhythmic, for example, children that are born in 2012 are now eight years old and they'll be in the system for the next, hopefully 10, 12, 16, 18, 20 years. They won't even be eligible until 28. So why the rush for young champions? Long-term planning is necessary. Don't rush, take time. Don't build in permanent mistakes. Pay attention to detail. Let them take time to have some fun because the hurry is really for you or for us the coaches, the clubs, the parents, the federations. And the rewarding of high difficulty, and that's again the, the rules, of course, can lead to coaching excesses because more repetitions, higher number and sizes of forces, more training time, all these excesses that I referred to earlier, more training time and reduced recovery time. Usually this relates, the higher difficulty relates to more complex rotations and leads to more under-rotated saltos, twists, and unprepared landings. Can lead to permanent errors, for example, legs crossed. Let's take a look at this um, this set of uh, excesses I'm referring to here from the perspective of a triple twist on floor exercise compared to the double twist. In most of our disciplines, the difference between doing a double twist or a triple twist is about 0.1 in difficulty value. What are coaches doing for 0.1? So these permanent errors, the legs will likely be crossed. The landings will probably many times be under rotated. Uh, there'll be extra stress, mental stress, maybe a bit of fear. There's likely to have been an injury. Then there'll be even more fear, more problems and lost training time. Increased stress and anxiety for the gymnast and the coach. Increased possibility that they train while they're injured. Increased coaching negativity that leads to anger and frustration and insults and blaming and punishments. All those things for one-tenth of a point. What can we do instead? Quality. Do the triple twist. Train. Train three twists, four twists, five twists. Train for the future. Compete two twists. That's just an example. Trouble is... Abuse of this kind, if the reward is high enough, can pay off if we promote competition difficulty for children because abuse to some extent becomes a necessity. Early high difficulty in that sense really becomes a race against puberty to learn that difficulty before puberty has been reached. Once again, train the future, don't compete the future. Building in permanent errors. Here's an example of a top gymnast from really a top nation as a deduction. And basically, I just picked five skills from that routine. There were, there were more on every skill, every time, in every competition for the rest of his career. He should have trained for future excellence rather than have to compete this at a world championship. No rush, take time for pe perfection. Don't build in permanent errors. Pay attention to detail. So I, I just want to look at it maybe from a different perspective. What are the cost benefit considerations of adding difficulty? And this really applies at every age and level. It should be gymnast-centered, not ego-centered, uh, egos of the coaches and so on. So if we look at this chart, for example, as we increase difficulty, it's pretty clear that the time, the investment, the cost, and I'm not speaking only of um, financial costs, costs in energy, costs in focus, costs in resources, costs in facilities and additional experts, can be very, very high. 
uh, and it goes up for a very small increase in difficulty. Costs can go very high. So for example, it go from three twists to four twists for most athletes, the cost can be very high. Or we can look at it this way, cost-benefit relationship. We benefit, of course, with increased difficulty, but at some point, the benefit goes down because the cost goes up. So we have to find a happy balance, perhaps somewhere around where those two lines intersect. And the potential costs are listed here. Um, and you can read them, time, coaching expertise, facilities, specialists, um, so on, fear, injury, deductions, failure, failure, negative coaching, confusion of skills, the single focus of a training environment. So what can we do instead? And always it's to focus on quality, put off difficulty until it's mastered. So the role and responsibility of legislation, our main legislative documents are the code of points. So when I refer here to legislators, I'm really talking about those that make the rules. There are other levels of, of authority above them that provide incentives for making rules like this perhaps. So I'm focusing here on age group codes, not the FIG codes. I have many comments about them, but that's certainly not the focus here. So if we reward some, if we require something, or if we reward something, and we know it to be unhealthy, then it's not gymnast center. And if we've been informed, then we are really ethically and legally responsible. Because whatever is rewarded determines the content of routines, the content of training, and in many cases, the content of coaches' actions. So most FIG technical committees have made good efforts to address these problems in the codes for seniors, but rules for younger ages by continental unions, by national federations, by local groups often need rethinking. So I'm gonna quickly look at the FIG age group development competition program, just a very quick overview. So firstly, what is the purpose of an age group competition program? So we need it to provide meaningful and accessible success experience for the majority of high performing gymnasts at each age. You have to consider when you make rules for your population that what are the safe possibilities and resources of the majority of your clubs, of your gyms, of your related federations or member federations. And you can't make rules just for a single star. You have to encourage the inclusion of mastered base elements for the future. You must encourage long-term participation and provoke development again for the future rather than force difficulty so high or reward difficulty so high that you lose gymnasts during that time period. Permit a focus on mastery and perfection rather than on difficulty. What I, what I mean by this to some extent is that gymnasts at this age shouldn't show everything they can do. That's for seniors. They should show what, they, what they've mastered. We have to focus on safe and health and quality, excellence, mastery, not difficulty. The, the rules at this, this age should permit everyone to have a successful experience not those that are only mastered by a tiny, tiny minority of the gymnastics population. Remember, this is an age group philosophy. And we need the rules to provide examples of gradual and safe development towards excellence. We want to avoid competition before age eight, at least formal competition, and any international competitions before age 12. So when I see some disciplines that have international competition at age five already, really? We really have to think. The growth and maturation information uh, should be used to designate age groups. And I use the word parking here. It should be possible to, to park rather than to stay in an age group one more year rather than to be forced to advance to the next higher level that requires more difficulty before that gymnast is ready. So common, I'm just showing an example here. Common might be age groups 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16 plus for seniors, for girls now. But better would be 8 to 10 to allow that one year overlap. 10 to 12 to allow one year overlap stay in that age group one year longer before being forced to go up and so on, all the way up the line. Allow the 14 to 15 year olds to stay one, long, one more year before being forced to go senior because you might lose them if they're not quite ready. So that's something to think about within your uh, environment. And then the use of compulsory exercises and modified optional rules. Compulsory ex exercises serve to educate coaches so they don't hunt the code of points to see what difficulty they can do. And compulsory exercises protect the gymnast. They protect the gymnasts from overeager coaches, from overeager parents, and perhaps overeager federations. So the FIGH group program and competition program, it's development and competition. So that already tells you it's really two programs that are related. It provides an athlete-centered recipe for the coach, for clubs, and for federations. It's really appropriate for the overwhelming majority of coaches and clubs in the world. Some will want to do something quite different, which is fine, but it's a recommendation. And it's a recommendation because many federations around the world don't have the resources or the expertise to produce a program of their own. These programs are also related to the 
academy program. So for example, level one, we have high performance one, two, three, four within the H group programs for all disciplines now. And there's a technical testing component with 10 technical tests. So level one of the academy program teaches approximately the content of high performance one and high performance two, and the first five of the 10 technical tests. Level two teaches approximately high performance three, high performance four, and technical test six to 10. Level three, of course, focuses on advanced skills for juniors and seniors. So the FIG at this moment recommends that all international age group competitions use high performance three and high performance four rules. Of course, there are no FIG competitions, at least sanctioned by FIG for men, women, rhythmic or parkour at this time, but the recommendation can stay nevertheless. And I can tell you that the full age group program for all disciplines in three languages is now on the FIG website under education and includes the videos linked to the manuals uh, in physical tests, technical tests and all compulsories. So the need for change and the call to be gymnast centered. The current model for success ignores children as human beings. We have to think children first and then performance. We know it leads to 80% attrition of the most talented for survivors, put that in quotations, but in many cases it's true. It leads to some five to six injuries of, very kind, of various kinds annually. And it ignores new knowledge in favor of what we've always done. A note here, those that kind of go in the direction of, well, we've always done this. And most of the coaches, let me refer to it as old style coaches, haven't had all that much success because winning is pretty unusual. It's pretty rare. So the success is not really there with what they've done, unless in some cases they've had incredible systematic and systemic advantages within their federation. So many of the viewers, many of those that have attended our academies and age group camps are the new generation. And I find that just wonderful, but you can, and you have to lead towards a future that focuses on the needs of the children. So study, learn, think, coach smart, update knowledge all the time. Question everything that's done and that you do and improve it. Agitate for or lead changes to rules, to expectations, to behaviors, to incentives. And change, change is not one event. Change is a process. It takes time. We won't, you'll never solve everything immediately, even though we would love to, but work at it. You're the next generation will depend on you and internalize what it means to be gymnast centered uh, in the sense of what I've spoken to here, but in the wider context of what gymnast centered means. And with this to say, leaders, please, please allow your coaches and gymnasts to train the future. Don't force them to compete the future. Don't force them to sacrifice the future for the now for a quick win at 11 or 12 and allow them to follow a gymnast centered pathway. So in conclusion, what I've presented today are not absolute. There are way too many variables and special circumstances. I hope it serves as some guidelines and maybe motivation for some deeper thinking about what it means to be gymnast centered in your environment and especially related to growing children. So I thank you so much for your interest and your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for such an informative session. You know, it was interesting for me to realize that uh, we can do, we, we don't realize that we do things uh, without realizing that uh, the negative impact on the gymnast, the potentially long-term damage. So I want to ask you, um, there's a lot of information to take in, a lot of good information, but if you were able to identify one or two things that could be implemented immediately, almost like in the short term, that could make a difference, what do you think that could be? <laughs> That's too good a question, <laughs> too, too difficult a question. Um, there's really no one answer because there are too many circumstances. Um, I, I think what will be important in, in light of maybe what I've said and others have said, and what is now a societal criticism, is really to review the existing age group rules in your environment because they can be changed quickly. To be gymnast centered. If you don't have compulsories for the lower age groups, consider making compulsories. And you can look at the FIG ones. And that, again, you don't have to agree with an FIG compulsory and you might want to do a better one. But let's look at floor, ex floor exercise, for example, it, for an eight year old. Almost no one will disagree that it will include a split, it'll include, include a handstand, it'll include a cartwheel and a round off. Um, um, a back roll, maybe uh, a balance. So no one will disagree. You might want to put them in a different order in the routine, maybe slightly different choreography if it's for women, but 
the, the, the basics are not in disagreement. So you know, why try to invent something that will include basically the same things? Um, so for um, maybe one other thing that can happen is for the FIG to more strongly endorse or recommend that for men, women, rhythmic and, and parkour, that the age group rules be used as at least as a model and not deviate too far from them. Now for trampoline, for acrobatics and aerobics, we know there's age group world championships and uh, they have rules that have been developed over years. And the age group program from the FIG has actually made sure that the high performance three and four that we recommend corresponds to what are, are the rules used internationally. But we don't have that for the other four disciplines. So I think that's all I can say. For right. <laughs> so my next question also is that with, uh, with coaches, we've got you know coaches education programs like the academy and the age group program and so on. But what about the legislators? What do you think? What are the different ways we can try to educate legislators to try and you know, change or improve legislation? Well, uh, there, I think there are different levels of legislation. I've tried to focus on those that, that devise the rules, the codes of points for the, the lower, if you want to use the word codes of points, the competition rules for lower levels. Um, many of them are also coaches. Okay, so uh, many of them certainly have access to the academy and the age group programs. In fact, anyone does because it's up to the federations to determine who attends, especially at the beginning. The FIG has done a little bit in that direction. For example, the technical committee members must attend a level three academy. And many of the continental unions have now said that their technical committees must attend a level two academy. So there's a step in that direction. But the, the, the legislators and especially the technical leaders, technical committees have to be steeped in the sport. It, it, it's, it, it, when, you, when you think of the huge dedication of gymnasts and coaches, we, we can't have people making decisions about their lives and their futures that aren't steeped in the sport, that are there because it's a hobby or that are there because uh, they like power or you know, the perquisites of, of being in authority. Um, you know, they have to be steeped in the sport and think, but they, they've all heard now, everyone in the world has heard uh, the gymnast uh, revelation, the abuse revelations. So it's a wider issue of not just uh, the academy and the age group programs, uh, because it'll involve all the things related to ethics, safeguarding, um, what it means for athlete welfare, anti-doping, um, anti-discrimination practices, to focus on health and science and more research in these areas. We really don't have a lot of research. Uh, you know, so we're going by what we've read and what's empirical, but we need a lot more research exactly what we're doing and what the impact is. So I, I think that, that for both of your questions, there's also that, that um, part of individual responsibility. If you're in a leadership position, you have a personal responsibility to know everything you can possibly know to be steeped in the sport and not just to sit back and make rules because it serves some other kind of interest. Mm. Thank you very much for such a, an important subject, you know, making us think that, uh, think more deeply about the, the gymnast, the impact on the gymnast, getting them to stay longer in the sport. I think that's such an, a powerful statement because these uh, early dropouts is, is for a reason, you know, and very often it's not a good reason. So I thank you very much, Hadi. It was a very informative seminar. And uh, you're part of the Education Commission. I wish to thank the Education Commission as well for putting these seminars together, together with the FIG staff, the media department, and the IT. So until next time, we just want everybody, please stay safe. Mm -hmm.